Welcome to another class of analysis of Boolean functions. And today we start uh, looking at uh, complexity of Boolean functions. And so, and so today we're gonna study the following, uh, the following paper. It's called, so this lecture is based more or less on this following paper. However, I did have to take a look at a bunch of other papers as well. But anyway. Okay, uh, so that's the paper we're going to study today. Um, it is a paper of, I should say, Berman. Right where the author is. Okay. Um, so, so the, as a disclaimer, let's. Uh, so we're always considering here a function from the Hamming cube to plus or minus one. Okay, the Hamming cube with n variables, and sometimes we will make. Sometimes we will make the um, identification of the Hamming cube, which the field of two elements, which is basically just zero one raised to the n. And that identification runs through the idea that minus one is identified with one or true. And one is identified with zero or false. Okay. And sometimes we use that identification, sometimes we do not use that identification. And any result you can, you can prove for one of them um, and you can prove for the other. Okay, so complexity. So what's the idea here? Um, we have a several measures of complexity. Um, so I give you a Boolean function, which you can interpret it, it as a certain circuit that accomplishes something. So I give you an input, the circuit computes something. You can also interpret it as a computer if you like. Um, and it gives an output, either true or false. And the idea is um, that we can measure how complex that circuit is. So that's the idea here behind complexity. Um, so, however, we have several ways of doing that. And you already know some of these ways. The first one is you can just measure the degree of your function. So that's the first and maybe most basic kind of complexity measure. So you can always write, as we saw, your function as a sum of certain coefficients, what we would call Fourier coefficients. Let me just write like that. The same sum is, the same uh, expansion is true whenever you're talking, if you're talking about here, or if you're talking about the, the, field, where the field of two elements. So. Um, uh, and, and if it is the Hamming cube, then you can characterize one of those. And if it is this guy, you can also, but they, they have slightly um, different formulas. In any case, you can always write the function like this and uniquely, these coefficients are uniquely defined in terms of the function. And so the degree 
So I should say degree. And the degree of F is, is basically, well, the largest uh, monomial you need to represent F. Okay. So that's more or less, we saw that a bunch of times in a bunch of other places already. So that's not a surprise. Um, what are the measures of complexity we have? We have also the decision tree complexity. There is a randomized decision tree complexity. And in fact, there is a array of a bunch of randomized complexity measures. Um, and there is even one related with quantum computing that we will see in the next class, not in this one. In this one, I will only focus on deterministic uh, complexity measures. So there is no uh, probability uh, distributions involved. Uh, but in any case, um, what's the decision three for a function? So if I give you a function, uh, perhaps you can decide uh, what that function does with a very simple thing, for instance. Um, so, so you start say with a node, I1, so that's me like a hypothetical decision tree here. Uh, and then you evaluate what that is. If it's uh, say minus one, you go to some place. And if it's one, you go to some, some other place. And then you evaluate some other variable. I, and you keep doing that, minus one, one, minus one, one. And at some point, you're going to evaluate some node, say, and you're going to say, OK, if it's 1, say, then the function is 1. And if it's, let's say, minus 1, and if it's 1, then you keep going, OK? So that's a, a decision tree, more or less. So basically what this is saying is that, well, maybe you only need to compute, I don't know, some values, but not all value, values of the, the coordinates to actually compute uh, uh, the function f, evaluate at a certain input. So you just follow one of the paths of this tree to compute your function, basically. And so you can see that you could start with other nodes. You could build this tree another way. And then, and then the rule here is that once you get to the leaves of this tree, uh, the leaves are all exactly the values that F should assume. So then you follow a path, and then maybe you have like a, 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 a vector with a, a million entries, say, and then you only need to compute 10 of them, most of the cases, say. And so the depth of this tree this, is a measure of complexity here. So if once I build the tree, then you can, you can say the depth. So the depth would say more or less uh, the number of variables that at most you need to query such that um, you can decide what the value of f is. That uh, will be what the depth of this tree is representing. Uh, but then you can try to optimize. You can try to take the tree that has the least depth. And that's the definition of decision three complexity. So decision three complexity is the minima among all the depths among all of uh, three, what so this is called a decision tree. So a decision tree for F, there are several possible ones because you can start at another node, you could mess around here, you can maybe put things that are not needed. And then, so there are a bunch of possible ways to create a decision tree for F. 
And then the one that minimizes the death is the decision tree complexity. As a remark, you will see in other places, dt of f being also um, represented as, there is a bit of annoying thing here in this complexity business is that um, there are a bunch of papers and there, and there was, I think there's still not a quite uh, um, homogeneous notation among all these papers. So sometimes you see things with different notations. So for instance, in the book and Ryan, Ryan uh, O'Donnell's book, the book we've been following so far, uh, not anymore, but it, it writes like this, but in a bunch of other places you see just as DF. Okay. Um, and you can wonder, oh, is there a relation? Well, we saw that more or less already. So, um, so let me explain. So lemma, and I'll prove that lemma only in words. So suppose you take, um, Suppose you take the tree that minimizes the decision tree complexity here. Okay, fine. So for each path of that, that tree, you have a, a, a specific value of f. That means that for each path of your tree, you can associate a set of variable, a set of um, X's in a set of X's in HN, such that once you evaluate that X using that tree, it follows that particular path we chose. And for all that X's, you have a, a, a particular value of F. That means that you can write F as a sum of indicator functions of say, um, so F is the sum of indicator functions of sets C of P, where P is a path in T, okay? So if X belongs to the, 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 the variables that go through that particular path, the value is specified. So of course I have to multiply here, but F of C or P, which is the common value that F takes for those axes. Okay, so now you have to determine what is the degree and most the degree in here. Okay, but this is following a particular path. Okay, so that means that uh, only a certain number of variables is predefined. And if, well, it's easy to come up with the indicator of this guy. And you will see that it's the degree of this guy is at most the depth, the, the size, the length of that path, okay, which is at most the depth of the function of, of the tree. Okay, so definitely you can write f as a function of degree, which is less or equal than the depth of that, that guy. So that's why you have this. Okay, so if you still don't get it, just think a little bit more as an exercise and figure out that one. Okay, and so what? Um, say as a, so as an exercise, perhaps you can write the decision tree for the majority function, for instance, and you can play around with these things. Um, Yeah, okay, since we're already talking about decision tree, let me introduce the randomized decision tree complexity. I said I wouldn't, but I will now. Um, um, so um, you can think of a randomized version of this. So let's randomize.
decision tree complexity. Okay. Um, and what is that? So let me write in. So you have a, you have all these trees, possible trees that could compute your function uh, f, compute the output of your function, and so perhaps you prefer one type of tree than the other. Okay, and so what you do is the following: you to let mu be a function that takes a, a, a decision tree. For f and maps into some number. And I'm going to require that this is a probability distribution. So I'm going to require that okay. So you come up with some probability. So mu is a probability distribution over the decision trees okay so come up with a, some probability distribution of the decision trees and that's it. so so before we were taking the tree we has the minimum depth but from a probabilistic way, maybe that, that tree is hard to find. So maybe you want just to select one tree at random or something like that. So then you come up with some uh, probability distribution. And then the randomized decision tree complexity is defined as what? Well, first of all, what you do is you summate over all the trees and you compute the expected, um, the expected, so you take a, 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 a vector x. So you want to compute your function at the vector x. And then you can ask, so if you have a particular tree, you can ask, well, how many queries do I have to make on x such that my tree has, uh, gives the right answer for f. Okay, perhaps my vector is a, a size of a million, but I only need to query, I don't know, 30 variables, something like that. And then if I get another tree, maybe I have to query 50 variables. So how many, how many, how many variables in average I have to query? So that's what we compute. So if, fix a vector X and you look at the space of all trees and you compute the, how many queries those trees make and you weight by your probability distribution. And so this is the expected query according to mu. So you can maybe write this uh, as uh, the expectation according to, to mu to the number of queries. Okay. But then what you do is you take the soup in X. So you take the worst case scenario. Okay. And then you try to minimize over all probability distributions. Okay, so that's the randomized decision tree complexity. Uh, so basically, so one way of saying this, basically, uh, you can see this as another way. You can see we select X and then we flip a coin, say a bias coin, and we decide if we're going to evaluate X, I or not. Okay, so you go through the variables, you flip a coin and decide if you're going to evaluate or not. And so the cost of this will be the number, the average number of queries, the expectations, which is this, this guy, this is like the cost. This is another way of interpreting this. 
And so then you take the maximum of those costs and you try to minimize uh, all the probability distributions. So this is not the way of interpreting this, this, this measure. And for instance, as an exercise, Uh, as an exercise, let me see. As an exercise, show that the majority function, the so majority with three variables, has decision tree complexity equals three, but randomized decision tree complexity equals eight over three, which is less than three. Okay, so these measures are not exactly the same because using randomized things, you can actually get some saving. And of course, lemma, the obvious thing, randomized decision tree complexity of F is always less or equal than decision tree of F. Because you can take mu here just to be a delta at some point x. Um, and uh, sorry, some, a, a delta in some particular tree, that tree being the, the choice of the decision tree complexity that minimizes the depth of the tree. And, and, if, and, if, um, and if you choose that distribution, just a delta that, at that particular tree, you will get exactly the, the this guy, the, the, the decision tree complexity of the function. And so far, you get less or equal. But as you see, it can be strictly less. But anyway, we, we won't talk about randomized, other randomized measures. So uh, in this lecture, just wanted to introduce, and then the next lecture, we will come back to it. Uh, so another complexity uh, so we will see a bunch um, bunch complexity measures here, uh, which is com certificate complexity. So what is certificate complexity? Um, so, so let say f be some Boolean function and you take some x. And so a fx certificate and this is not exactly what you see uh, in the papers it's just it's kind of a it's kind of a, a convoluted explanation it's not quite clear it just came up with the mine which is more or less exactly the same so our certificate for X is just is a subset. Say X, SX, such that um, if Y is another vector and it coincides with X at those values, then f of y equals f of x. It has the same value. So that's the notion of certificate. That is, well, if I want to know when the function has the same value as the variable, as the value of x, I just need to uh, compute the values of these variables. That would be a certificate. If they're equal, then I guarantee they are equal to the value of f of x. Um, 
And so, and so C of F, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention here that you will see in the literature, this as written sometimes as R of F and sometimes R zero of F. And zero stands for zero, uh, zero error. Um, you know, there are other ways of computing those trees um, because another interpretation of those three, of this decision tree complexity is, um, is if you can write an algorithm, uh, a randomized algorithm that can compute your function in uh, at most a certain number of steps or something like that. And so if you go through that definition, you can change it a little bit. And then there, there are other ways of defining. And this zero here stands for zero of uh, three thing. We will see more about that in the next uh, lecture. But anyway, you, you will see sometimes in the literature as R of F and even as R not of F. And these things are a bit confusing. It's, it's hard to know what exactly they're talking about in each paper. There isn't so far as universally uh, 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 adopted a uh, notation. So in any case. Um, and so what you do here for the certificate thing is kind of obvious. It just, it just, for each X, you just minimize over the, the certificates for F. So SX is a certificate. For x, um, you minimize over the sizes of the certificate. So for each x, you take the optimal certificate, and then you take the worst case scenario. So you can already see the bunch of these definitions is always playing with this min max and max min idea, um, which has its origins in. Um, and numerical analysis of linear systems and et cetera, and, and computation of eigenvalues and et cetera. And computation of eigenvalues of uh, um, minors of matrices and so and so forth. So this, this is always playing around with this. Um, this complexity measures is in a way always playing around with this min max and max mean idea. And you can also, uh, lemma, which is also very easy to see. That certificate is less or equal than decision tree complexity. Why? Because, well, suppose you take the optimal decision tree, then the path, one, any path in that tree is a certificate for any X that follows that path, okay? And so if you think that way, this is an equality is obvious. Um, now we enter into the role of the sensitivity measures. And these are very important because in the next few lectures, we will see the proof of the sensitivity conjecture, which was a recent paper in 2019 published in the annals it was a sort of a big result, but it has a, like a one page solution as well. So it's, uh, so it's nice to know that we, we still can publish uh, uh, one page papers in the annals. They are very rare nowadays, but still possible. And so we will see the, uh, the solution of the sensitivity conjecture in the next lectures. So what's the sensitivity here? Um, sensitivity is also very easy to define. Um, you fix a variable and you look on, along the, the coordinates of the variable. So you have a bunch of plus and minus ones and a, 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 a list of 
a million plus and minus ones, and you just go one by one and you flip and you make a note when the value of f of x changes when you do that. And so, and so you count how many, how many times it changes, okay? And then you take worst case scenario. That's it. You just count. So this is i from one to n, and you just flip that variable, and you see that's the sensitivity. Worst case scenario, that's the sensitivity. So you know that if you have like a million variables, and the sensitivity of a function is, say, uh, ten variables, um, uh, that means that with, I mean, probability. Um, uh, like nine, uh, nine, nine, 99 percent would be like 10 divided by a thousand. Uh, no, that would be uh, yeah, so <laughs> what I mean is so if if n is like a thousand and the sensitivity of a function is like 10 and you take a variable x and you randomly flip, um, say, one digit, what's the probability that's going to change the value of a function would be that, which is like 1 over 100, which is like 0 0.01, which is like 1%. Um, and so it's very small. So that's, that's one way of thinking about sensitivity. And um, and so to see the sensitivity conjecture, we need to define a slightly more general um, sensitivity, which is block sensitivity. And what is block sensitivity? Well, block sensitivity is the following can also define just straight away. You're going to maximize, so again, worst case scenario, mx, okay, subjected that there exist blocks b1, that is a partition of blocks or sets, say, bmx contained in n, so this is standard for union, but meaning that this union is disjoint, okay? This sets have no intersection. Okay, so you have a, 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 a union of disjoint blocks contained in the set from one to N, such that if I flip all variables in that block, Put M. This is different from f of x for um, b1, b2, up to bmx. And that's it. Okay. That's the block sensitivity. So, of course, that we have a Lemma. Oh, the first thing note that we can always assume to take the length of these blocks less or equal than the sensitivity of f. Okay, because imagine the following. Suppose you have a block, and if you flip all the elements of that block. So when I, what I mean by this is I flip every single variable from that block, okay? And so if you flip all of them, you flip the variable, if you, you flip the, vari the value of, f, of x. But then 
you can think, well, you have that block. And so if that block is larger than the sensitivity, there's definitely one of these variables that it can flip without changing the value of f. Because if that, was the, if that wasn't the case, the sensitivity would be larger. And so it can just go back to the original, uh, at least in one of the variables. And so you can keep doing this until you reduce the size of the block until you get exactly the sensitivity and that you can't change anymore because you hit the sensitivity. So you can always assume that that is true. Um, and then lemma, Uh, sensitivity is always less or equal than block sensitivity. Proof. Um, so, uh, so in the case of the blocks, um, um, Let me see. Yeah, this, this is sort of obvious. I won't even write the proof. Because, so you're taking worst case scenario here. So if I present one scenario, then the block sensitivity will have to be bigger than that scenario. So what is the scenario? Well, you take a variable X, such that it realizes the sensitivity, that means, you have exactly S of F coordinates if, that you, if you flip one by one, then the value of X changes each time, F of X changes it each time, okay? Then you can select the blocks to be uh, just blocks of just one element in each one of these elements that you change it, uh, to, to, that realizes the sensitivity of the function at that particular point X. So in that you have the number of blocks will be S of F. And so block sensitivity will be larger. Okay, so if again, if you don't get it, listen to my explanation again and think a bit more. But basically just select the blocks as the single elements and those elements will be given by the coordinates of the X that realizes the sensitivity for your function. And so the sensitivity conjecture, which was solved, is that the block sensitivity is bounded by the sensitivity raised to a certain power, okay? And I will explain a little bit more why, and you will see why this, this sort of conjecture is, was made, and, and, and this is sort of a more general uh, phenomenon. But in any case, um, that was the conjecture and then it was solved. Uh, let me write here, we solved with C equals four. Okay. It's two conjecture that it, I think it should be two. The best one should be two. And that can't be improved because there are examples that have this relation. But I think people still don't know how to show that, how to reduce C from four to two. But in any case, it was solved with C equals four. And we will see the proof of this, this result. It may be another exercise is um, um, to show that if F is monotone, that means it, it increases with the sum of the variables, then you can show that block sensitivity equals sensitivity equals certificate. Okay, exercise for you guys. 
Let me state another lemma. Which is block sensitivity of F is less so you could then decision tree sensitivity. And basically the same proof that we show shows that uh, block sensitivity of F is less so equal than certificate of F. Okay, with the same proof. And in particular, the proof for the certificate would show this guy because certificate is always less so equal than that. But in any case, I will show only this guy. Um, proof. Um, so you take X in HN and you take some blocks uh, such that uh, the block sensitivity of F equals that number of blocks. So you, you, you have realized the block sensitivity. And uh, of course, if you flip each bi, you get a different value. And so let T be a decision tree. And then T must query some I in BM for every M. So if you look at all these blocks, then once you try to evaluate F using that tree, that tree must query one variable inside, at least one variable inside each one of these blocks. Okay, suppose it wasn't the case. Well, that means that if I flip, suppose that B1, we look at the block B1 and no variable in that block B1 was queried by the tree. That means that if I flip any of these variables, for instance, all of them, the value would stay the same because if you would follow the path along the tree, uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, query those variables, variables. And so that must be the case. Okay, but, but, if, that's, but if that's the case, then the depth of that tree has to be greater or equal than the number of blocks because if, if, if you query, at least one guy in each block, then it has to be greater or equal than M. And so if you minimize over the trees, you get that the decision tree complexity of F is greater or equal than the block sensitivity. And a similar proof for the other. And then we leave as an exercise. Okay. Um, and so before we keep going, there is a pseudo sort of an implicit, not spoken conjecture. which reads in uh, the following, uh, all nice, so in a way it's like meaningful and it has some nice properties and et cetera, measures
So, so all these measures are polynomially related. That means that if you have a complexity measure one, then you always have something like this complexity measure two. So you, you always have some a here and raised to some power a, but you also have the opposite inequality. Have some b complexity measure two f raised to some b plus some a um, less than b. That's the unspoken conjecture. So whenever a new important complexity measure is introduced, you want to see what's the relation with the others. And it's often conjecture that are related polynomially. That means in, in computational complexity, it's important to differentiate things that are related polynomially and, and related not polynomially. And usually when it's not polynomially, it's something like it's exponential or something something like that. And so it's important to know what's the, let's say, computational time of a certain algorithm um, related with some other algorithm. And that's basically what's behind here. And the idea is that most of these measures are polynomially related, okay? And that's in part what the sensitivity conjecture is about because the sensitivity bounds from below the block sensitivity and you want to know what, what's the upper bound. And so you want to know what's the best constant you can put here and so forth. Um, I should say that perhaps the most precise statement would be something like, um, something like putting a A here and maybe another E there and somebody prove for A equals four. Okay. Um, but that's the idea. Um, and so let, let us see a lemma in this direction. I mean, you already saw a bunch of lemmas, but they're all basically uh, implying linear relations. Let's see some that implies some nonlinear relation. So certificate complexity is less than sensitivity times block sensitivity. And if that is true, then we do know that sensitivity is less than block sensitivity. And so far, we get block sensitivity squared. Okay, nice. Um, we do have another, we don't have examples. Okay, now we have, so let, let me prove that. Okay. Um, again, so if you take X, um, you can take blocks. the joint blocks with n less so you can the block sensitivity of that. And um, and but such that M is um, um what do I want for M? Um, and M is maximal. Okay, so recall that uh, um, oh, maybe I should say something about in the definition of block sensitivity in a moment. Um, so,
Um, maximal. I guess that's the right thing. Yes, uh, it is the maximum. So you have to take here, it is worst case scenario all over. So you take the maximum uh, mx for that particular x, and then you take um, the maximum over all the x's, okay? Um, so maybe I forgot to say that. So, so you fix x and you take m where mx, so see, let's put a subscript x here, is maximal. Okay. Um, but anyway, so we can assume, of course, as I mentioned before, that each bm is less or equal than the sensitivity. The size of each guy is less or equal than sensitivity. And, um, So, so I claim So if I write that set here as a possible certificate then f of y is indeed a certificate, okay? Suppose it's not a certificate. Well, if it was not a certificate, then you could, if, if it was false, then you define b m plus one as the i's in n, minus all these guys, so outside, such that yi is different than xi. Um, Yeah, so, you, you, so if you fix, so suppose that's not true, okay? Suppose that's not true. Um, then there exists y um, with yy equals xi. So let's say this set here is s. Um, for every i in s, but fy is different than fx, okay? That's what happens. If you assume that that thing is false, then this, you must have a counterexample. Okay, so fix that y and then define these block. Okay, of course, this is non empty because if that was empty, it, it would mean that y i is, is equal to x i not only inside s but also outside, and then it would have to have the same value, but it, it has not. So this guy is non empty. Okay. And, and so, and so if I, and, and, and y equals flip bm plus one of x, because that's the that definition, because inside these blocks, as y is equal and outside these blocks, I just took all the elements that could be different. And so this is f, y is flip m m plus one and has a different value. So you just, so now, and this guy is outside all these blocks. So you just created a, a, an extra block for x, which is impossible. because of the definition of the choice of these blocks, I chose mx to be maximal, so I can't, I can't select something larger. And so, so S equals B1 union, Bmx is a Fx certificate 
And so that implies that um, uh, C of F is, uh, at least that the local certificate at X is less or equal than MX, okay, which is less or equal than BS of F. So say I put X here to denote the local certificate at X, and then you take the maxima over all those certificates because certificates also worst case scenario, but it's always bounded by the S of F. And so you get it, okay? Oh, sorry, wrong explanation. Um, it, it was right in a way. So the local certificate is less or equal than what? Than the size of S, okay? Because S is a certificate. What is the size of S? Well, the size of S is at most MX times the number of elements in each block, which is always bounded by the sensitivity, S of F. But MX is a most block sensitivity. And now you have the local certificate bounded by something that is independent of X, then you take the max, and so you get certificate. And so you get this. Okay. Great. So, and now you have this quadratic relation. Okay. So, um, and so in, in, in the next lecture uh, or, the, or the next second lecture after this, um, when they talk about randomized um, and et cetera, I will put here a, 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 um, a table. And in this table, you will see the relations among all the different kinds of complexity. And this is the most up to date table. It's, it's in a paper, so you can find it. I will, I will give the reference anyway. But this is like uh, you study it. There is a big table, and there are relations between um, several complexity, and there are things that are open, but people don't know. There are things that are conjectured, and so on. And then the other things that are known, but can the people conjecture can be improved, and etc. Okay, what else? Okay, so let's give some um, examples here. Um, so suppose I take F to be the big end of a bunch of ors. So I have k squared variables. So n here equals k squared. And as an exercise, you have to show, example in exercise, let me put exercise. Uh, show that the degree of f is total, so it's n, but, Sensitivity is block sensitivity, is C of F, is square root of N. Okay. So, um, so in this function, for this function, you know that the degree of F is like equals the sensitivity of F squared. Okay. Not for all functions, but only for this example. Um, and let me give another example where the degree can actually be the sensitivity raised to a power less 
the one. Okay. And that is the following one. So define this guy here, which is, oh, and for these examples, I'm using the identification minus plus or minus one, you identify with um, zero one. And also here. So maybe I should write, you have to identify with HN here and also here. So you consider this three variable function and then you take FK, EK to be a function from F, um, to raise to 3k to 0, 1. And um, what you do is that you take an x and you break it into x1, x2, x3, which with each xi in f2, 3k minus 1. Um, so you have a very big variable, you break in three pieces, three equal pieces, and then you define EK recursively by E of EK minus one of X1, EK minus one of X2, and EK minus one of X3, okay? And so, so then you ask, well, what is EK minus one? Well, if K was one, uh, this would just be the original. If K was two, then I would compute E of this guy, E of that guy, E of that guy, then I compute E over everything again. Okay, and then you keep doing that. So another way of seeing this is you have a certain node, you split in three, you split in three, three, and three and so, and then here you put the values and then you, you split three by three and so on. And then you compute the value here, compute the value here, value here, and then you take those, three, those, those things three by three and also go up and so on until you get the value here. Okay, that's uh, the idea here behind. You have a certain tree structure. Um, and this is some, some iteration you can do with any function e. I'm just doing with this particular one. Okay, and then show, you have to show that the degree of ek is not three to the k, is actually two to the k, but that's more or less easy to see because the degree of this guy is two. So when you take those, those products, those things, um, you only multiplying twos, uh, and so on. So the degree is only increasing like a power of two. So it's two to the K. So it's not total, but again, show that the sensitivity equals the block sensitivity equals the certificate equals three to the K is actually full. Okay. So meaning that for in every X, if you change any of the variables, you get a different value. Okay. Um, and so that implies that the degree of F is not S of F squared like it was before, is actually um, log two over log three. And this is roughly 0 0.63 dot dot dot. Okay. So you can have things as far as this and as far as and as close as this okay so that's why studying this complexity measures is a sort of a hard business because um it's not true that there is like a power which is exactly related and so you can get below and above bounds is the truth is that there are 
for the above bound, is usually the case that above bound needs a power which is different than the below bound. Um, and you see that in a bunch of places as well. I mean, as far as I can, can tell, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, in this subject. Um, far from it, I would say. Um, um, so proposition or, or lemma, I'm saying, I say proposition. This is due to Nizan and Zagadi. In a bunch of these lemmas are due to other people, you know, probably forgot to mention. Um, hopefully they won't be. Uh, mad at me, but in any case, um, block sensitivity of F and this is a very nice uh, argument. Block sensitivity is bound by the degree of F is squared. Okay. Um, And, um, and together with the um, um, sensitivity conjecture, um, yeah, together with the sensitivity conjecture that we proved after one, this thing will say that block sensitivity is polynomially related with sensitivity, it's also polynomially related, related with degree. And so, we will see that later on. So let's try to prove this. Okay. Um, for this, we need the lemma. Then we postpone the proof to the end. If P is a real polynomial, say polynomial, uh, and B1 is less or equal than PI, less or equal than B2. Say for I equals 0, 1, 2, up to N. And there is some X naught that can be real, such that uh, P of X naught in absolute value is greater or equal than C, then you can bound the degree of P by the square root of Cn divided by C plus B2 minus B1. Okay. And that's re reminiscent of um, uh, Markov's inequality for polynomials. We can, we actually will use that to prove that lemma. Um, but in any case, let's, uh, Let's continue. Uh, so let's assume that lemma. And so let f of x be expanded like that. Um, and well, let me put some other numbers here. Let me say these are c. And let a be some point in the Hemi cube. Uh, that realizes the block system too. Okay, um, we will assume that f of a is zero here, just for the moment. It doesn't matter. If it's not zero, you just change f by one minus f and everything is, is fine. And here, I'm again making the, the transition that I'm uh, from minus, plus or minus one to uh, zero one, okay? All right. Um, 
then um, we will define a key y1 to ym uh, function by the following. One, you will, um, so, okay, so let me, so from now on I identify f with this polynomial, okay? And so, so I will say if xj equals, um, okay. <laughs> Ugh, sorry. Um, so, so what you're gonna do is you have you have f of x. It's it's a polynomial now, and you're gonna replace some of these variables by y variables. Okay, so how you do it? Um, so you set um, x j to be y y i if i j a j is zero and j is in one of these blocks. Okay. So if you have one guy on these blocks, then and aj has happens to be zero, then you set xj to be y y if j belongs. Oh sorry. I should say better bm. BM. If j belongs to bm, so all the variables in bm you set to be equal to ym um, if aj happens to be zero. So another maybe combined way of saying this is you set xj to be aj ym plus, um, oh, sorry, set it to be one minus aj ym plus aj one minus ym. If J belongs to BM. So that way, if J is zero, um, then this is zero and it's just YM. And if J is one, then this is zero and just one minus YM. Okay. And then three, you just set XJ to be AJ if J is not in these blocks. Okay, so you have effectively created a new polynomial where um, with only m y variables. And, um, and what do you know? So we have, um, well, definitely the degree of Q is less so equal than the degree of F. Definitely Q of Y belongs to zero one for every Y in F to M because it's just evaluating F actually. Um, yes, and then what do we have? What is Q of zero? Well, Q of zero, well, if I put zero, it means that um, I'm putting zero here. So, uh, um, so if a j was zero, I'm gonna set x j to be zero. And if a j was one, I'm gonna set x j to be one because I'm putting zero here. And so this is exactly just p of a. Sorry, this is exactly just f of a, which is assumed to be zero. And what is q 
Q of EI, okay? So if I put Y1 to be say one and all the rest equals zero. So let's look. Um, if I put Y1 to be, so this is M is one. So I put this guy to be one. And um, so XJ is being one while X, uh, a, J was zero and xj will be one minus one, so zero, while x aj was one. So I'm flipping. So that would be exactly just f of flip bi. Let's see m here to keep with the notation of a, which is different than f of a f of a, which is zero, so it has to be one, okay? Um, so, okay, so we have this, and then let's, let's symmetrize this guy now. So you take all permutations and you just permute the variables, and you have this, so this is the projection over the symmetric functions. So you can write this as the projection over the symmetric functions of Q. Okay. Okay, I, I symmetrized. So the symmetrization only depends on the sum of the variables, of course, because you can't commute them. And so, um, and so that implies that there exists some real polynomial such uh, Q symmetrize of Y equals that real polynomial in the sum of the variables um, for every Y in, sorry, in the, um, um, points of the Hamming cube, okay? That's kind of obvious because you only have those values. You can apply some interpolation, Lagrange interpolation, and find this guy. Okay. So what do we know about this guy? Well, we do know that if you evaluate um, it's always between zero and one. Okay. Um, and why is that? Because, well, it agrees with that function here, Q. Okay. And, but what is this function evaluated at a vector, say, whose the sum is I? Well, it's actually an average of all the vectors whose the sum is I of the function Q. But the function Q only assumes values zero or one. And so this value is between zero and one. And so the value of R is also between zero and one. Okay. And then we also know that R of zero, well, R of zero has to be zero because you only put zero and implementation of zero equals itself and so on. So that has to be zero because Q of zero is zero. And who is R of one? Well, that has to be one. So Y has to be one because R of one is exactly when you um, put one of these variables here, say to be one. So you, you would do an average of all over the Qs of EI and you summate over all the Is. And we do know that each one of these guys is one. So the average is gonna be one. Okay. And so if exists an X naught, um, between zero and M, um, oh, sorry, between zero and one, uh, and in particular between zero and M. It's being equal to one, because our zero is zero, our one is one. Okay, so now we are in the, in the, Satisfying this lemma here. So this should uh,
Okay, so then you apply the lemma to lemma. To lemma implies that the degree of R is greater or equal than the square root of C, which is one, times M divided by um, square root of C. And then here is C plus B2 minus B1. But C is one, B2 is one, and B1 is zero. So this is just two. Another way of saying this is that the degree squared is greater or equal than M. That is, that this is true. Okay, but who is M? M is the block sensitivity of F. And what is the degree of R? But degree of R is definitely less or equal than um, uh, the degree of um, yes degree of Q symmetric, of course it has to. But that guy is less or equal than the degree of Q which is less so you could end the degree of F. And so we're done. Because then we have the inequality that we wanted, which was this one. Okay, so now I have to prove the lemma. Uh, yes, let me prove the lemma. So I didn't finish. And Proof of the lemma. So, how do we prove the lemma? Um, so, we need something which is called, which I won't prove, and I will give you as a uh, reading exercise. You can find this online. Mark calls polynomial inequality, which states that uh, the maxima of R prime of X for is less or equal uh, Uh, yes. Ugh. Let me write this thing here. So we're going to use Markov's inequality, which says that the maximum of the derivative is less than the degree of R squared, the maxima of R. Uh, for every more polynomial, real polynomial. Okay. And I will leave you to find this thing online. Um, the proof is not hard. Um, um, actually, the, the guy that optimizes this inequality are the Chibichev polynomials, um, or translated Chibichev polynomials. Um, in any case, we use this inequality and we'll leave as a reading exercise. Let me write here, reading exercise. So how can we do that to prove the lemma? So what was the lemma? Well, the lemma said that if we take this, then it's greater or equal than some C, that's C prime. Um, and the lemma also said that the PI was between B1 and B2. So, and so if I write PX, I can always write as a 
pi, the i closest to x, plus p prime of x prime times x minus i, so to that x minus y is the most a half. And so that would be less or equal than d2 plus c prime over two or greater or equal than d1 minus c prime over two because the derivative of the maximum is c prime and I'm taking if x between zero and n, I'm taking an i, an integer i between zero and n, which is closest to x. It means that the distance has to be less or equal than half. Okay. And so then take r of x equals to p of nx minus b1 minus c prime over two. And what we do have with this guy, well, this now is a polynomial between zero and one and apply, so we can and apply Markov inequality. And the Markov inequality will say that, well, um, the supremum of the derivative is less or equal than the degree squared of r less than this, but what is the derivative will be pn, pnx prime soup, okay, uh, x between zero and one, which just seems to say as to replace this guy and say x between zero and n, which we know that this is at least c times n. Um, oh, sorry, this is c prime n, and this is less or equal than the degree of p squared, which is the same as the degree of r squared, less or equal to the max of p. But what's the max of p? This guy is always greater than equal than zero and is less or equal than this minus that. And so this is, should be b2 minus b1 plus c prime. Okay, so then you conclude that uh, degree of p squared is greater or equal than c prime n divided by b2 minus b1 plus c prime, but this is greater or equal than c divided by f, b2 minus b1 plus c because c is less or equal than c prime and you can easily show that this is true. And so you finish the proof. Okay, so now all you need to know is Markov's inequality and I'll leave as a reading exercise, okay? And uh, as another reading exercise, uh, this one, and this one has a as corollary um, that the decision tree is less or equal than well, we do know that a certificate is less than sensitivity times block sensitivity. But sensitivity is less than block sensitivity cube. And block sensitivity is less or equal than um, certificate. Okay, and so there you go. Um, Um, and so this one is an immediate corollary. You don't need to need it, you just need to realize. And this is, um, this is, this is, this is theorem 11 in the paper I wrote in the, in the introduction of this lecture. Okay, so you go ahead and then read, and you see you will read part of the paper. So read theorem 11. Okay, um, and then to finish, um, I want to do another um, result. Um, so proposition. The decision tree complexity is less or equal than the degree of F squared times the block sensitivity of F. And that implies as a corollary that the decision tree complexity of F is less or equal than twice 
the degree of f to the power of four. Okay, so that already shows that the season three complex in degree are polynomially related. Okay. Um, so how can we show that proof? Uh, we do need a lemma, and if we have that lemma, then everything follows more or less easily. Um, so um, lemma, so let f of x be f zero of x plus So you separate F in two bits, some part and the part that has the largest uh, degree. So the coefficients that come from the largest degree. Okay, so you separate the F. And then there exists some subset S naught such that one um, S naught is at most size degree of f times the block sensitivity of f and two s not intersects f is different than zero for every s such that uh, degree of f equals s and the associated coefficient is non zero so what i mean is by every guy that is indeed in this uh, let's say largest part of f, let's put in this way, uh, I have a set that intersects every one of these guys and has at most this, this size, okay? The proof is quite simple. So let me even put as I claim, we claim that if we split f equals this way, then there exists such a that. So indeed, what happens here? So what you do is you select um, B1 up to say BM, B, um, oh no, not, not that. Let S1 up to SK be a maximal collection of the joint sets of n with each sj having exactly degree of f and a and a oops a of s j non zero. Okay, so what, what I'm doing, so I'm looking for those guys which have non zero a j, a s. And these, these are sets, subsets of, of sets of n, n elements. And then what you do is just take uh, a collection, a sub collection of those sets that um, is all of them disjoint. And then you take the one which has the largest number of, of those guys. Okay, so you so the, the, the point is I can't add another set. Any other set that is any other set that satisfies these two conditions has to intersect one of these sets. Okay, by definition. And so so um, S not equals the union of these guys which is disjoint by the way, by definition, satisfies two. Okay, now I just have to bound this and that's more or less trivial. I have at most k sets and what is the size of that set? Well, um, Um, I claim 
that um, so I claim that this is less or equal than um, um, degree okay we, we want to show that this is less or equal than the degree of f times block sensitivity of f that's what we want to show and that would finish the, the result so how, how can we figure out that Okay, let's figure out that. Um, now, so observe there exists bi contained in SI for each i such that Is different than F zero. Okay. So 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 if that was the case, that then it would imply that the block sensitivity of F is greater or equal than K. Okay. Oh, so why why is that? Well, um, if you look at the function f x, and I just put the variables x in the block b i, and put zero every where else. So if I look at this function, x, I mean, x bi, that maps to that function, okay? So now this is a function of only uh, the variables that live in the blocks bi, okay? I claim that this function is not zero, okay? Um, Um, sorry, not bi, it should be, let me write this more carefully. You take x s i and maps to f of x s i and you put zero um, outside bi, s i. So you look here, Okay. Um, if I put zero outside SI, all these guys here will be um, a zero because they have less than degree of F variables. And so it will at least catch one of these zeros. So this part goes away. Okay. And in here, it will survive exactly only the SI block that I choose. Okay. Which is non zero because this guy is non zero. So this function here is definitely non-zero. It's exactly just that multiplication of the variables in this block. Okay. And so if I flip um, the variables in it exactly, and so there, there must be a value where it's different. So if I flip all these blocks in SI, I get one from zero. Okay. And so, but that's exactly doing this, okay? And so, so therefore, if I flip exactly the SI, I, I would get something different. Um, because, yeah, so what you're saying is if, so suppose by contradiction that this block BI doesn't exist. So for every block that I flip at zero, um, this would have the same value, okay? In particular, I could flip the whole thing, okay? But if I flip the whole thing, I definitely get a different value than f of zero. Um, you, you, you see what I mean? Because, well, okay, I didn't explain it quite well, because when you put zero, there's the constant term here that will survive as well. 
Uh, and so since when you put zero, this guy, only the block SI here will survive and the constant term. Then uh, th that is if I flip um, this guy, it would have something different, okay? So basically the idea is just to restrict to SI, put zero everywhere it was to realize that there must be a sub block that, that this is true, okay? Again, if you didn't get it uh, at the first or second time, let's go again. Um, but in any case, this shows that the block sensitivity of F is greater or equal than K. Um, and now you look at the size of the SJ. What's the size of the SJ? Well, it's in most the degree of F. So, so that implies that S0 is less or equal than K times the degree of F and that's less or equal than the block sensitivity of F, degree of F. Okay, I hope I explained this well. Oh, this, so that proves the claim. So how can we actually use the claim? And um, yeah, so let, so let's now say X be some point in here and, um, and let uh, G of say X of S naught to be just F of, well, it should maybe pick a point B here, say point B. Um, um, and you put here B, S naught, and then X on, say S naught complement, S naught complement. Okay, so outside uh, uh, where uh, S naught is from the previous, from the claim. Okay, from the claim above. So you restrict B to S naught and you restrict, uh, and you only look at the uh, variables outside, okay. Uh, the block X naught. And of course, yeah, the degree of G is less um, um, than uh, the degree of F. Because um, why is it strictly less? Because, um, S naught intersects each one of these guys. And I'm setting all the guys in S naught to be something. So I'm at least reducing by one, each one of these guys. So then I get the function with a degree which is strictly less. Great. And um, the block sensitivity of G definitely doesn't increase because it's just F restricted to some point. Okay, so when you restrict, you don't increase the block sensitivity. It's something you can realize. And so, um, so repeat this process until you reach a constant. Now you have G and then you create some function H, which as an H will be created from the S dot coming from G and so on, you, you keep going. Until a constant function is found. Now, how many times do we repeat this process? Well, at most degree of F, Um, yes, and then how many queries we uh, have to use in F to create this set S naught. Okay, let, let me say something first. So you repeat the process until you, until you reach a constant function. The constant function is found, okay? Um, okay, so I have to say something more because 
you have to repeat the process, but the process given, given a B and an F, you construct something. So the B is the same for every function you're gonna construct. The only thing it changes is define G, and then for this G, you get the new set S naught, and you define some H, but using the same, the remaining bits of B, okay? So, so that implies that this constant is F of B. Okay, in the end, you have to reach F of B. Okay, so now you have an algorithm to compute F of B. If you, if you can know exactly how many steps it takes in the worst case scenario, that's gonna bound the decision tree complexity. Because you can show that the decision tree complexity is the same as saying, here's an algorithm to compute F, and in the worst case scenario, it takes at most degree DT of F steps to compute F. Okay, you can show that's the same, uh, defining using trees or using this algorithmic language is the same, results in the same thing. That is decision tree complexity of F equals the, uh, the uh, fastest algorithm uh, in the worst case scenario that computes F. And then, and then you have to minimize the number of steps. Okay, it takes to compute in the worst case scenario an entry for F. Um, so these are isomorphic uh, uh, concepts and definitions, uh, which I'm not gonna write, but you can more or less guess it is. So here we're writing an algorithm to compute F, and I have to know how many steps does it take to compute that. Well, it does take uh, at most degree of F steps to create these functions, um, this G and then the H and then so on. Um, and then, but at each time I have to create a set as not. And this set as not requires some queries. And how many queries do I have to take to, uh, um, how many queries do I have to take to compute that set? Okay. Um, um, so what is the set? How do we create this set? Well, we do know the size of the set here by the lemma. Degree of F times block sensitivity of F. Okay, so, we, so I have at most degree of F steps and each step I have to create a set whose the number of queries I have to do, which is the size of the set is at most degree of F times block sensitivity of F. That means that in each step, uh, I have at most these numbers and to create the next set and most this number and et cetera. So, um, so then, um, so then by the, by the claim, that implies the decision tree complexity of F is less or equal than what? The um, total number of steps I take times uh, to construct these new functions and for each one there is associated as not set that can be constructed in the at most degree of the particular function you consider at the moment times the block sensitivity of that function, but all of them are bounded by the degree of F times block sensitivity of F. And so then you get the result. Okay. Um, and here we are using the idea that this, the idea here is that this is the minimum on the uh, X um, of the steps. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to minimize over all the algorithms. Um, uh, what the maxima over x in hn of the number of steps algorithm a a uses to come in more precisely number of queries a uses to compute f of x 
Okay. Well, we leave this as an exercise as well. Okay. So you come up with an algorithm to compute f, and then you you take the worst case scenario. So there's how many queries you have to use to compute f of x. Okay, and then you take the worst case scenario and then minimize over all the other algorithms. That's exactly, um, you can show that's exactly equal to the decision tree complexity, okay? Okay, that's it for today. And then in the next lecture, we will probably talk either about the sensitivity conjecture or the randomized uh, versions of complexity uh, measures. Okay, and see you next time.